Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I wanted to get with you again and talk about pressure a little more specifically than we did in your lecture for the week. Let's start with the I, revisiting the idea of absolute and relative scales, just like temperature, just like level. You know, we can even have a level in a reactor that's a relative scale instead of an absolute scale. We have relative and absolute pressure scales. When we talk about absolute pressure, that means any pressure at or above absolute zero. And there is no negative from an absolute scale. So where you see here, this says perfect vacuum. This is the lowest pressure possible. The equivalent on, our, on your temperature scales, of course, would be the Kelvin and the Rankine, where zero degrees Kelvin or zero degrees Rankine are the absolute lowest possible, and there is no, there are no negative numbers from there. So from zero, from a perfect vacuum, we could measure pressure, any addition of pressure. We put some molecules in that space and we've added energy to that space and pressure goes up just a tiny bitty bit. We are now above zero inches of mercury absolute or above zero millimeters of mercury absolute or above zero pounds per square inch absolute or above zero kilopascals absolute. But once again, it's that A that matters. The absolute absolutely matters. When we talk about atmospheric pressure, we're talking about what we normally experience at sea level, about 14.7 PSIA, pounds per square inch absolute. So if we decided to make that our new normal, well, that's a phrase I don't like hearing anymore, our new normal, and say that atmospheric pressure is now zero pounds per square inch. That's relative to atmospheric, not relative to a perfect vacuum. So zero pounds square inch gauge, or zero pounds per square inch vacuum, or zero inches mercury vacuum are all a relative scale of pressure. And then anything above or below that adds numbers. So I might have, if I start here at this point on this blue arrow and start headed down, heading down, right, drawing a vacuum from atmospheric. So right now we're at 14.7 PSIA or zero pound square inch gauge. And I start drawing a vacuum, lowering pressure. I am now at one pounds per square inch vacuum, which means one pound per square inch away from the relative scale of zero pound square inch gauge, which is 14.7 PSIA. So if I'm at one pound square inch vacuum, I'm at 13.7 pounds per square inch absolute. Now you can see on this sheet, there's the, the thumb rule, 0.491 pounds per square inch is equal to one inch of mercury. So you could easily do a conversion and you're going to be doing these conversions. So you will have to convert, uh, for example, three pounds per square inch vacuum to inches of mercury vacuum or to inches of mercury absolute. So you have to remember where you're starting at on this relative versus absolute scale. The units matter. All right, I'm going to bring up, a, load up a video I shot last night. All right, here you can see two readouts on this Yokogawa display. The top one is our main steam supply header pressure, and the bottom one is condenser back pressure. What condenser back pressure is, is the amount of pressure in inches mercury absolute above absolute zero, which is why it's inches of mercury absolute. If you look to the, to the little 
top right of the 2.88, you can see the inches mercury absolute. So this isn't in reference to, this isn't measuring from atmospheric pressure, right? Atmospheric pressure is the relative, is a relative zero. This is measuring from an absolute zero. So now let's look at the relative scale. So atmospheric pressure is the same as 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute or zero pounds per square inch gauge because that's the reference zero. It's also 29.92 inches of mercury absolute, which means 29.92 inches of mercury above an absolute zero. But because it's the relative scale, the atmospheric pressure is also zero inches of mercury. Now, the idea between zero inches of mercury and zero inches of mercury absolute is one of the things that tends to mess students up. Also, zero inches of mercury vacuum. So recognizing that when we say vacuum, we mean less than atmospheric pressure. And so it's some amount of inches of mercury below atmospheric pressure and not above the absolute zero. Okay, so let's look at the 2.89 inches of mercury absolute. Remember, that's an absolute pressure. So it starts on the bottom and not from atmospheric pressure. To equate inches of mercury absolute to atmospheric pressure, that would be 29.92 inches of mercury absolute. But we're talking about a vacuum or back pressure. So if we were going down from 29.92 inches of mercury absolute and talking about vacuum, we would have some amount of vacuum below the relative scale. But our meter indicates the amount of pressure above zero. So 2.88 inches of back pressure. All right, this is the point in the video where I was looking for the clip, uh, the short five minute thing I filmed of a reactor scram where we put in an air leak and the condenser back pressure goes up because we're losing vacuum until we hit our uh, scram set point. But apparently, not only did I film all of this last night with the microphone on the camera off, but the piece that I thought would be the most interesting, I didn't film. So what you would see is if we had an air leak in the condenser, our condenser back pressure would go up because there's more air in the condenser. There's less vacuum. So it would go from 2.88 or 889 inches of mercury absolute to 3 inches of mercury absolute to 3.5, 4, 4.5, 5. And what we do is we have a set point because as back pressure builds in the condenser, right, which means vacuum is getting lower, which means there's more air in the condenser and air on the condenser end of a turbine system is bad, right? You want a vacuum to help draw the steam through that low pressure turbine, extract as much energy as possible, make it as efficient as possible. And when you have that air, you have turbine blading heating up. You also have uh, less condensing action of the steam, which means the moisture or the quality content of that exhaust steam goes up, which cause, causes impingement damage to the turbine blades. So not having uh, low back pressure is bad. We want to have as low back pressure as we can. And so, you know, anything around two and a half to three and a half inches of mercury absolute is really good. Once it starts degrading from there, that's bad. And so we set a turbine trip set point of eight inches of mercury absolute. And we train our operators to monitor all the parameters when they see it degrading. We have procedures they enter. In fact, it's ABN back pressure, which means an abnormal procedure. And they take actions to uh, find the cause and, and fix it. And then if they can't, or if it's degrading too fast, they will scram the reactor before they hit the turbine trip set point. Anyway, that's just a little something, something. So there you go. All right, let's uh, walk through the panels here. Behind the blue box, we're starting off with a high-pressure core spray system. That's just an, inje uh, 
ECCS, Emergency Core Cooling System Injection System. Then we've got a low pressure injection system. Then we've got our safety isolations. A lot of that logic along with our MSIVs, our main steam isolation valves. Then we've got another core spray system, but it's a low pressure. And we have our RICSI, so our React Core Isolation Cooling. It's another feed water injection system. We have a lot of ways to get water into the core. After that, we've got some containment isolations. And we then move into our research. So our research flow is how we drive flow through the reactor. All right, we're on the full core display. This is where we can move rods. Then we have our feed water system, how we get water into the reactor. That's all of that with there. Uh, then our condensate system. And then we get into cooling water systems. We have lots of different cooling water systems. We've got CERC water, TMU, TSW, service water, a bunch of different ones. This is also, there's tiny little sliver there is uh, our air systems, control air, instrument air. And then we get the turbine. So those two, uh, one on top of another displays are the turbine controls and all the turbine monitoring stuff, then the generator, and then the electric plant. Wow, that was fast.